This is Dimitri Lascaris for The Real News. This is part two of our interview with esteemed uh, climate scientist, Michael Mann. Uh, Professor Mann talked with us in part one about a recent article in New York Magazine, which painted a very dire, uh, offered a very dire assessment of humanity's future as a result of climate change. And in this part, I'd like to discuss uh, with Professor Mann uh, some of the current uh, weather phenomena that we're seeing, extreme weather phenomena. And Professor Mann is a distinguished research professor and a director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. He's the author of the book, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, and his latest book, co-authored with Tom Tolles, is titled The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics, and Driving Us Crazy. Uh, welcome again, Michael. Uh, thanks. Good to be with you. So this week, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration announced that the first half of 2017 was the second hottest on record, and that last month, June, was the third hottest June on record. And NOAA scientist uh, Ahira Sanchez Lugo remarked that these high temperatures are, quote, extremely remarkable because temperatures had been expected to drop after the end of the strong El Nino in 2016, which contributed to record temperatures in that year. Do you agree with uh, Ms. Sanchez Lugo that temperatures thus far this year are extremely remarkable? And uh, if so, why? Yeah, I would say that it's somewhat remarkable. Um, one thing, they're, they're more or less on the trend line. So it, it's not like these temperatures are coming in so far above our model projections that we can't make sense of them. Um, they're more or less on the trend line or a little bit above the trend line. And that's after you know, um, you know, a decade where some of the numbers were coming in a little bit below the trend line. And you know, when they were coming in below the trend line, you had the uh, all too predictable chorus of climate change deniers insisting that climate change had stopped, that warming had stopped, that there was a pause in warming. And that was all nonsense. Um, temperatures tend to fluctuate from year to year uh, due to various uh, influences, including natural influences. Um, now uh, we are seeing some of those um, influences sort of push us in the other direction. We had uh, a several year long El Nino event, which boosted global temperatures quite a bit. And 2016, the warmest year on record, benefited from that warmth. It is a little surprising that uh, 2017 hasn't fallen off as much as we uh, might have expected, given that the El Nino event, which is a global temperature boosting event, has subsided. And we've instead at least gone into a little bit of a La Nina, which is the, the opposite um, sort of cooling side of that phenomenon. Well, one of the things that is going on here is that much of the warmth um, in recent years uh, hasn't just been related to El Nino. It's been related to a very warm Arctic. Um, the Arctic has been remarkably warm, and that's consistent with what the models predict. We expect this so-called Arctic amplification of warming, in part because of the melting of ice, which allows more of the sunlight to be absorbed, um, uh, further warming the Arctic. Uh, and a lot of the warmth that we've seen in recent years has at least in part been due to, to this very warm Arctic. And so even as the El Nino event has subsided, that Arctic warmth persists. Now, some of the temperature compilations um, estimate temperatures in a way that doesn't fully take into account the contribution from the Arctic. And it has to do with the fact that we haven't had measurements there that go back um, you know, the whole century, for more than a century. And so uh, some groups simply leave out that region because we don't have long-term measurements. Other groups find ways to interpolate in that missing data, which is important because we do know it's the fastest warming region of the Earth right now. Um, but yeah, it's a little surprising, but we're not outside of the uncertainty range of the models. What these latest observations tell us is that we are uh, on track, um, that we continue to see warming um, at the rate that the models have predicted, and it will continue on if we don't do something about our continued burning of fossil fuels. Uh, once again, the truth is bad enough. We don't have to exaggerate it. It's cause enough for um, urgency and acting. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what is realistically possible at this stage. You know, I attended a COP21 in Paris, uh, December 2015 for The Real News. Yeah. Spoke to a number of climate scientists there. Uh, one of them, for example, was Kevin Anderson. And we talked about, amongst other things, the 1.5 degree Celsius threshold. And I think it's fair to say that Professor uh, Anderson and others uh, have said this more recently. Uh, Dr. Eric Rigneau made a presentation recently, which uh, he indicated, I'm paraphrasing, that really 
uh, staying beneath 1.5 degrees Celsius at this point is, is not realistic. And more recently, uh, Michael Oppenheimer said that even a, staying within the two degrees Celsius threshold is going to be an extreme challenge. And I think he estimated the likelihood of that happening at about 10%. Uh, do you share their skepticism, skepticism about our ability to remain beneath 1.5 or even two degrees Celsius, given uh, where we currently stand and what the current trends are? Yeah, I'm always wary of um, sort of weighing in on the likelihood or, or unlikelihood of sort of actions that are a matter of willpower, because um, we have defied those sorts of predictions in the past, whether it's World War II or the Apollo project. Um, the history is replete with um, examples where people said, no, ju there's just no way we can do that, and history proved otherwise. Um, we often surprise ourselves in what we're able to accomplish when we really hunker down and and we um, you know we decide we're going to do something. And uh, I think that's very much possible with renewable energy. And I do think there's a tendency uh, by some to sort of underestimate uh, the rate at which we could move away from a fossil fuel-based energy economy to a renewable energy economy. So I'm always wary of weighing in on what's possible or not possible um, uh, when it's a matter of human willpower. Um, what is more relevant, in my view, are the physical constraints. If we garnered the will to, to dramatically move away from fossil fuels, if we fully incentivize renewable energy, if we were to meet the Paris obligations and then improve on them further in a few years, we can get on a course. The, the math uh, tells us this. The math and physics tells us that we could still put ourselves on a course where we keep warming below two degrees Celsius. That's three and a half Fahrenheit, what many scientists would describe as sort of the level of dangerous interference with the climate. Uh, I do agree with Kevin Anderson um, and others that 1.5 degrees C, that may be slipping off the table. Um, and, you know, that's sort of was stated as an aspirational goal, two degrees Celsius stabilization uh, being stated in Paris as the thing we really need to um, keep warming below that two degrees C. And uh, there was an aspirational goal of we'd really like to keep it, in fact, below 1.5 degrees C. If you're a low-lying island nation, um, you know, if you're if you live along the coast, if you've been, you know, dealing with unprecedented floods and droughts and heat waves. You know, there are people who are already feeling dangerous impacts of climate change, and arguably we should prevent as much warming as we possibly can. And, and that's part of why the 1.5C has become an aspirational goal, uh, especially among um, uh, island nations that are already threatened with inundation. That's going to be really tough unless we employ controversial uh, technology um, called carbon sequestration uh, to literally suck the CO2 back out of the atmosphere. It's really expensive, it's hard to do, um, but we might have to turn to those technologies if we really decide that we need to limit warming uh, even below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Just cutting our emissions, transitioning to renewable energy alone won't be enough to do that. We'll actually have to engage in active efforts to take some of the CO2 back out of the atmosphere. Uh, it's expensive, but you know what would be more expensive? Catastrophic climate change. Right. So uh, one thing I'd like to talk to you lastly before we conclude our interview is something that we're seeing this summer. It's quite striking in certain parts of the world, including here in Canada, where I am. Out in British Columbia, we've seen devastating uh, wildfires uh, spinning out of control in many parts of the province. Uh, we've seen uh, similar, uh, similarly devastating wildfires in California, Portugal, uh, where a number of people died recently. To what extent can we say with confidence that there is a link between uh, climate change and this phenomenon in particular that we're seeing, uh, these, these extremely intense and proliferating wildfires in various parts of the world? Yeah, I, th there's a very clear link. Uh, and in some of these cases, like the 2015 California wildfires, we've actually published some work that demonstrates that uh, one of the features of climate change related to how it changes the, the properties of our jet stream and, and, the, and the sort of the, um, the way weather patterns um, move or don't move around, uh, that that 
uh, phenomenon may have been implicated uh, with the 2015 California wildfires. So there are cases where we can point to very specific mechanisms that we think are being exacerbated by climate change and say there was probably a linkage there. More generally, when we step back and we look at North America and we see that there's been a tripling in the extent of wildfire over the past half century, um, that's not a small change. That's not a subtle signal. That's a big signal. Um, we can see the, the impact of climate change here. And in a sense, it's because these wildfires, uh, forgive the pun, represent sort of a perfect storm. Uh, you have various factors coming together. Extreme summer heat and drought, diminished snowpack, which means less uh, spring runoff, um, and warm winters, which allow pests like pine beetles to infest our forests and weaken them. Um, you bring all those factors together and you've got a recipe for massive wildfires, and, and that's what we're seeing. So the science is very clear that it predicts this, and the observations are very clear that we're seeing this. Um, there is a connection. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you today, Professor Mann. This has been Dimitri Lascaris uh, speaking to climate scientist Michael Mann, and look forward to our next conversation with you. Thanks, me too. Enjoyed this. And uh, this is Dimitri Lascaris for The Real News.